Please join me in the prayer of illumination. God of power and grace, fill us with the wisdom of your word and the understanding of your spirit, so that we may be your church, a people with dreams and visions that work in all of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. just incredible. It just seems like day after day. And it's just been beautiful. So just enjoy it. I guess that's what we should say. Salt and light. She's already mentioned it. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its taste. How can it be? Its solidness be restored? It's no longer good for anything. It's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to the all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. There are all kinds of theories about how to motivate people. I have one. Los Angeles Dodger pitcher Don Sutton had won a game in eight weeks. A critical member of the press was suggesting that he be dropped from the starting lineup. Future looked bleak and Sutton felt terrible. And before a game, Dodgers manager Walter Alston tapped him on the shoulder and said, I'd like to speak with you, Don. Sutton prepared himself for the worst. Don said, Alston, I know how the past couple of months have been for you. Everyone's wondering whether you, we can make it to the playoffs. You know there's a lot of pressure. I've had to make a decision. Sutton had visions of being taken off the mound. Then Austin continued, if the Dodgers are going to win this year, looking at Sutton in the eyes as they're going to win with Don Sutton pitching. Come what may, you're staying in the starting job. That's all I have to say. Can you imagine how that, what that meant? Sutton's losing streak lasted two more weeks, but because of his manager's encouragement, he felt different about it, and something in him was turning around. He found himself pitching the best ball of his career. In the National League pennant drive, he won 13 games out of 14. Don Sutton, great pitcher, great man. So as I said, there are all kinds of theories about how to motivate people. We can do it through guilt, through fear, through shame. But these were not Jesus' methods. Jesus motivated it through positive messages of hope and encouragement. It's always upset me that I hear some pastors in, in all kinds of situations, not necessarily in one denomination, but who have used fear or shame or some of those tactics to, to motivate people. I've never felt like that was ever a good motivation. I don't think it's anything to really last. You may scare them for a minute, but that's about it. It's, it's just not, it just doesn't work in my opinion. So consider our lesson for today. Jesus says to his followers, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine that? Here is a motley crew of farmers and fishermen and tax collectors and housewives in a tiny remote village in an obscure part of the world. And Jesus is saying to them, you're the light of the world. Please. Talk about a statement of faith. Light of the world? That much? It must have sounded absurd even to them. Now you want to hear something really absurd? That's us. We are the light of the world. Well, if we just all catch a glimpse of what that means in our own life. We are the light of the world. John, in his prologue to his gospel bill on Isaiah's vision, said this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome him. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the true light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world he was made through him, and the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1, 1 through 12. That's us. It really is. Later in John's gospel, Jesus speaks to the people of his time and affirms John's description. I am the light of the world, he said. Jesus said, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When we think of a light, writes Kevin Burhoff, right away we think about what? The sun. We've been taught that the sun is the center of the solar system. It is the light of the world. Now here's some figures that reveal the sun's great. I get, I get, I'm fascinated by figures about the distance in space and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's mind-boggling if you, if you just think about it. For instance, the sun is 93 million miles from Earth. If a baby would start flying to the sun at birth, and travel 150 miles per hour, this baby would be nearly 71 years old before he arrived. I don't know who came up with that, who ever figured that out. Got, I, all I astronauts estimate that the diameter of the sun is 109 times than the, that, that of the Earth. Its output of energy is 70,000 horsepower per square yard per minute, and the temperature of the sun's surface is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, light was the first thing God created. Read it. Some of the first words recorded in the Bible are these. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Genesis 1, 3. Now, scientists tell us that all matter and energy comes from light. And our life depends on it. Furthermore, if we were deep in the earth in a cave in which there was no light and it was pitch black, it would still not be dark enough to extinguish a small little candle. Just think of that. With all of that darkness, one little light changes it all. People in Bible times knew far more about darkness than we do. Light was a luxury. There was no street lamps on a dark night. If you were traveling, the world was a scary place. Those were treacherous and criminals were plenty. You were thankful that cities were often built on hills. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, Jesus said. Many of the villages in Judea, in Judea were built on summits or sides of the mountains and could be seen from a long way off. From a great distance, you knew the location of the next village because of the light from that hilltop. But darkness was not the only problem on the road. At the end of your journey, light was still a luxury. Palestinian homes were generally dark. They usually had just one small window. They had no electricity, no light bulbs like we have. Their light consisted of a lamp, which was a bowl filled with oil with a wick in it. When they needed light, the lamp, when they needed to light the lamp was placed on a lamp stand. The most difficult part of having this light in the house was, of all things, in lighting the lamp. Remember, they didn't have matches or lighters. As a result, no one wanted to get their light, let their light go out because it took so much work just to get it quick going again. However, when people went out of the house, it was dangerous to leave the light on. So on, for, for safety reasons, when they left their homes, the lamp would be taken from its lampstand and placed under an earthen vessel where it could burn risk-free. See where all that comes from now? Of course, no one likes a light only to put it under a basket or an earthen vessel. That would defeat its purpose. So as soon as someone returned to the house, they would return the light to the stand so they could shine. All very mundane. The second thing Jesus was saying was when he said that we are the light of the world is that we have something the world cannot have anywhere else. We have the key. Mother Teresa was speaking to persons who had come to meet her from all over the world. I've mentioned this before, parts of this. Among the groups to which she spoke was one of the religious sisters from many Northern American, North American orders. After her talk, she asked if there were any questions. One woman sitting near the front said, yes, I have one. A 
as you know, most of the orders represented here have been losing members. It seems that more and more women are leaving all the time. And yet your order is attracting thousands upon thousands. What do you do? Without hesitation, Mother Teresa answered, I give them Jesus. Yes, I know, said the woman, but, but take habits, for instance. Well, do your women object to wearing habits and the rules of order? How do you do it? Mother Teresa replied, I give them Jesus. Yes, I know, Mother, said the woman, but can you be more specific? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa repeated again. Mother, said the woman, we are all of us aware of your fine work. I want to know about something else. Mother Teresa said very quietly, I give them Jesus. There is nothing else. What do we have that the world cannot find anywhere else? All we have is Jesus. We're often reminded these days that we live in a pluralistic world. Today there are persons of many religious backgrounds who are calling on our country of their home. And we can learn many things from our new neighbors. If someone should ask you, though, what is distinctive about Christianity, I encourage you to do as Mother Teresa did. Give them Jesus. That's all we have. The greatest heresy current today is that all religions are the same. They're not. Christianity, Christ, certainly all the world's great religions have something worthwhile to offer, and you can find help in all of them, but what you can't find is the story of the prodigal son or the good Samaritan or the rich young fool. There is no higher order of life than that which Jesus taught. Christianity as an institution might not be too appealing at times. Certainly in my background in the United Methodist Church, what's going on there is not too pleasant sometimes, or especially now. But if you understand the life and teachings of Jesus, he has no peer, literally. We have a responsibility for the world, folks, you and I. We also have something the world cannot find anywhere else. This brings us to the last thing we said. We're not the source of our life. We are but reflectors of a much greater source. Jesus is the one who has touched our lives and given us the power and the authority touch others. If you have the opportunity, give them Jesus. That's all you have. Final story. Eric Butterworth once told about a college professor who had a sociology class go into the Baltimore slums to get case histories of 200 young boys. The students were asked to write an evaluation of each boy's future. In every case, the students wrote, he hasn't got a chance. 25 years later, another sociology professor came across an earlier study. He had his students follow up on the project to see what had happened to these boys. With the exception of 20 boys who had moved away or who had died, the students learned that 176 out of the remaining 180 had achieved extraordinary successful careers as lawyers, doctors, and businessmen. The professor was astounded and decided to pursue the matter further. Fortunately, all the men were in the area and we, he was able to ask each one of them, how do you account for your success? In each case, the reply came with feeling, there was this teacher. The teacher was still alive. So he sought her out and asked the elderly but still very alert woman what magic formula she had to use to pull these boys out of the slums into successful achievement and careers. The teacher's eyes sparkled and her lips broke into a gentle smile. Really very simple, she said. I love those boys. I love those boys. Folks, it's no wonder those boys succeeded. They had a teacher to love them. Once there was another teacher that I know of who also loved his students. He saw possibilities in them that no one else saw in them. And he saw possibilities in them that they didn't even see in themselves. You're the light of the world, he said to them, to us. And so they became. The love they received from him they passed on to others. Today there is no place in this world 
the light that they receive from him doesn't shine. Because of fierce persecution, it's sometimes only a faint flicker. Sometimes because of the weakness of his followers, the fire is uncertain and tenable, but it still glows. And now it's in your possession. It's in mine. But we are the light of the world. You and I. What an awesome responsibility. But at the same time, what an extreme privilege that we have. Father, we looked at ourselves and wondered, maybe perhaps as the disciples wondered, could he really mean it that he's talking about us? We know ourselves and we know our limitations and our weaknesses. And we wonder sometimes, how can we light up anything? But that's what he's called us to do and be, be his people and to share the light that we have received in our own lives with those around us. You see, that's quite simple when we think about it. But we can't do it alone. Oh God, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. And number 566.